I'm sure you're fairly familiar with a common story parable that's been shared of a person, man or woman, it doesn't matter, that is confronted with a natural disaster, whether it's fire, flood, earthquake, or some other threat to his or her life. And as the story progresses, there's each of these different opportunities for rescue in the midst of the calamity, whether it's a boat that comes by, a rowboat for rising waters, or a helicopter to retrieve someone from the fire's danger, or other people. And over and over again, the victim in the natural disasters oh, says, no, no, God will rescue me. And then, of course, the inevitable happens, and the person dies and appears before God, very angry and questioning. Why did you not rescue me, God? To which God responds, what do you mean I did not try to rescue you? I sent a boat, I sent a helicopter, I sent other people. And the lesson of the story more often than not, we're looking for extraordinary ways when God prefers to use very ordinary ways to reach and to rescue us. But we choose not to see them as God rescuing. Because the man had rejected all the various offers of rescue because none of these ways these means were ways he expected God to rescue him. How often when we say God's not helping us is the truth is that we fail to see what God already has provided for us to save us, to hear his voice and to see him in our lives. Maybe God is speaking to us right now, but we cannot hear because it is not a voice we are looking to listen to. If there is a few things that are constant in the world besides death and taxes, there is the power and ability to choose and to decide. But often we are overwhelmed with a decision or a choice. We find ourselves stuck in, what do we do now? What choice should we make now? Is it the right choice? Should we do it now? Should we wait now? Is this the right time or not? Some of you are not even paying attention to me right now. You're thinking about what you need to do later on today, perhaps, or what you want to eat or where you want to eat later today or some other awaited task or dreaded encounter that must be handled. We may know the power and the answer, but we may not like it. We may be caught looking for a second option or a third option or a second opinion and someone else to intervene, to stop, to do to finish. Sometimes we just want a clear, honest, and direct answer. And remarkably, sometimes we can get an answer that is given clearly, honestly, and directly. But a lot of times we fail to hear or see the answer right in front of us. Because the answer in front of us did not come as we wanted to hear it or wanted to see it. We rarely are patient in listening to something or someone we do not want to hear or see something or someone we do not want to see. The scripture reading today is about in the middle of the Gospel of John, a 
Gospels whose intentions are made plain near the end of the book, that it was written so that you may come to believe or continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Often the gospel is compared to as a biography, but it's more than a biography. Each gospel is a purposeful persuasion of faith to convince and testify that a first century Jewish rabbi from Galilee was none other than the Messiah of Israel. Not only that, the son of the living God. And it seems that throughout the gospels, we encounter some that are more easily persuaded than others. And it's interesting that those that come early into the faith are those who have been rejected by others in the faith. We catch Jesus in the temple, walking along the east side of the tall porch that Herod the Great has built, an area called Solomon's Colonnade, during the Feast of Dedication, as it's described in John. This is an additional holiday, one not listed in the Torah or any book in the, New, in the Old Testament, recognizing an event that happened about 160 years ago when Jewish defenders blocked the temple from Syrian invaders, when the oil that was only meant for a day lasted for seven. This Holiday is being held in December, and it has come to us as Hanukkah. Solomon's colonnade is probably serving as a bit of a wind barrier this day against the cold east wind that's pretty common in the Middle East and Israel that time of year but the colonnade is certainly not stopping the cold stares of some of the Jewish temple authorities who are gathering around Jesus to ask him a two-part question. Are you the Messiah? Now, it's not the first time, it's more the first time in a direct way, that Jesus is being asked, but it's not the first time Jesus has been asked about it. And it's not going to be the first time that it's he will be misunderstood. Earlier in the gospel, we encounter Nicodemus, a Pharisee that travels under darkness of night to visit with Jesus, recognizing Jesus' teachings as from God, but failing to understand what Jesus' teachings were calling him to do. John the Baptist is encountered as testifying to Jesus' greater authority and then accordingly diminishes his work and activity. Jesus encounters a woman in the noonday sun at a well in the land of Samaria, a land that most Jewish people literally walked around to avoid. And the woman who encountered him goes to the town elders and asks whether she has encountered the Messiah or not. And we read that the town came to believe not just from the woman's testimony, but also from their own time spent with Jesus. There were crowds in Jerusalem who said, he is good, as well as those in the crowds who said, he was a deceiver. There are healings in John. Now, all of the miracles are described as signs, 
signs point to something. And there are healing signs, the feeding of the 5,000, and these long monologues, teachings, the I am statements. He has already declared himself the bread from heaven, the light of the world, and the good shepherd to all who would hear. He has done both the show and the tell, and yet they are still asking, are you the Messiah? And they want it to be a plain answer. They want Jesus to speak an answer that they would understand and recognize immediately as yes, the final proof, the convincing argument, the sign perhaps, or the teaching. Scripture, its testimony has revealed time and time again the truth of God's revelation that God comes to each in a manner God chose. And the one called to faith was willing to change in response to encountering God. Moses at the burning bush, Abraham with the travelers coming to the oaks of Memre, Jacob and the vision of the staircase to heaven not one of these who encountered God in some way came to faith in a way that they were expecting God to arrive to them. The encounter was always unexpected in some form. And yet they had eyes to see, ears to hear, and recognize what was before them. The crowd gathered at Solomon's colonnade is not seeing a Messiah standing in front of them because they did not see the kind of Messiah they wanted in front of them. Do we turn our eyes and close our ears because what God is showing or what we hear is not what we would like to see or listen. Because we have a remarkable tendency to find whatever we are looking for. And we tend to accept the answers that we already agree with. But we also know from life that we sometimes cannot see an answer even if it's right before our eyes. And sometimes the answer we agree with is not the answer we ought to accept. Jesus' testimony to this place has been plain and true. I have done what you have seen, you have heard what I have said. Jesus seems to be almost plainly, plaintively saying, yet it's your refusal. Your refusal reveals you do not, nor will not, ever belong to my sheep. Not because I refuse to let you in, but because you refuse to come and be part of me. You have, have probably encountered someone in life who has read the scriptures or was raised in the church even and has watched some documentaries filled with doubts or convincing arguments revealing the faults and they know you are still affiliated with some congregation, and they have asked, do you really believe all that stuff about Jesus? 
and usually they might press the issue a bit with a claim or belief that they are sure will bring up an argument or find you having harboring doubts in it. What evidence do you share? And will your evidence confuse or convince? Often in our encounters, we discover that the matter may already be closed before we even give an answer. Sometimes our confusion is with the conclusions we have settled on and can no longer see another perspective or another answer. We may be stuck because we do not hear another possibility or see a direction to go. In a world that has answers available within seconds at our fingertips, we may need to look past the first listing, scroll past the others and find the hidden already in plain sight. What we need to see and hear may be just past our confusion and already looking and talking to us. It just may need the nudge past our conclusions, the push through our presumptions and encounter us when we are ready and willing to hear and follow. We may be more stubborn than actually stuck, comfortable with the obstacles around us rather than the opportunities before us. If we are always looking for fault and blame, we can find ample resources to draw from. And if we are looking for what is right in with the world, we will find evidence of the same. What you are after may be right in front of you, do you see it, hear it, refuse it, obey it? Whatever draws your passion will change your perspective. Sometimes we just need to look at what we choose to see and to listen to what we choose to hear Maybe it is time to change one, the other, or both. Or maybe you just need a little more patience, a bit of time for the confusion to pass, the dust to settle, and the sky to clear. And then decide whose shepherd are you going to hear and follow. Amen.